Please find your seats so we can begin our next session. Did the video already run? Oh, good. That's very impressive. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that short video showcasing A4A and our members' commitment to sustainability. I want to say thank you to the Chamber, particularly to the Queen of the Aviation Summit, Carol Hallett, for having 28-plus successful aviation summits over the years. We've been pleased to be part of it. The last time we gathered as an industry in person was March 5, 2020. Within a couple of weeks, we were locked down. Nobody was flying, with rare exceptions. I don't know anybody who could have predicted the toll the pandemic would take on our industry. Before the pandemic, the U.S. airlines were said to have fortress balance sheets designed to withstand a financial impact three times worse than 9-11. Within days, airlines were hemorrhaging cash, billions of dollars each month, fighting for survival and doing everything to avoid bankruptcy. Airlines offered voluntary leave packages. They borrowed huge sums in the private market. They cut costs. And then we worked with labor and government leaders to draft a plan that would keep employees on the job, the payroll support program. Some have disparaged the PSB calling it a bailout or accusing airlines of mismanaging funds. These claims are simply inaccurate, unfounded, and frankly, irresponsible. Every cent of PSP dollars went directly into the pockets of airline employees, nowhere else. Here's something people need to realize. Of the money we received, it covered only 55% of what we paid out to our employees during that period. The Treasury Department and the Commerce Department, or the Commerce Committee have examined how the funds were used, all good. It was the most successful program, as Chairman Peter DeFazio said, of the entire CARES Act. Without PSP, we might not be flying at all. Without PSP, the U.S. could look like what much of Europe does, where there is no cooperation between the government, the airlines, and labor. Anybody who's flown recently through Charles de Gaulle or Schiphol or Heathrow knows what I'm talking about. The situation is not good. The reason is we learned a lesson from 9-11. I was at the White House at the time. We put a loan program together to help the airlines. But the terms were so onerous that only one airline took out a loan. A bunch of airlines eventually went bankrupt. Jobs were lost, pensions were destroyed, and it took years for airlines to recover. We did not make that mistake again. It was predicted that travel would come back not until 2024, but clearly people want to travel. We are flying over 2 million people a day, and we're trying to meet that demand. Well, doing it always while prioritizing safety. The challenges are many, and we're trying to meet those challenges. Some are within our control. Other challenges are simply out of our control. Extreme weather is responsible for more than half the cancellations in the first half of this year, not to mention power outages, space launches, and security issues. We're being appropriately pressed hard by DOT to get things right. We always try to get things right. Nobody wants delays or cancellations. Our customers are the very core of why we fly. We're pleased that operations have shown improvement as the summer came to a close. We've been hiring aggressively, even in today's tight labor market, which is impacting industries across the economy. In fact, right now, U.S. passenger airlines have almost as many employees as they did pre-pandemic. We are hiring and making a huge investment of people to get there. Additionally, carriers are adjusting schedules, updating travel policies, to offer increased flexibility to our travelers and continuing to invest in technology to improve the travel experience. Relaunching the industry requires the full participation of all parties across every segment of aviation and the government. So we're not supposed to talk about AC sta ATC staffing, but we need to have an open conversation about it. The FAA shut down training of controllers in 2020. It's just reopening now, another victim of the pandemic. 
Back in July, NATCA President Rich Santa said, highlighted, that between 2011 and 2022, we were down 1,000 certified professional controllers. He pointed out that we should have 1,000 more than we did, not 1,000 fewer. Hardly a day goes by that we won't get reports of a ground delay program or staffing triggers at ATC centers. We're working with our partners at the FAA very, very hard to ameliorate those impacts, which is the way it should be. Look at the problems, get together, collaborate, and try to fix those problems. We all need to have enough people in place. Having fully staffed ATC facilities isn't just about smooth travel. It's about safety. Safety is a top priority for transportation department. It certainly is for us. As I said a minute ago, nobody wants a delay or a cancellation. But our planes will not fly if it's not safe, period, end of story. Anyone who criticizes an airline in the aftermath of a major weather event needs to learn how intricate airline operations are and how interdependent airlines, uh, airlines are on weather, ATC, and many other factors. If we truly want seamless travel, if we want aviation to be in the safest mode of transportation, we all need to readdress ourselves to modernization. Government must take action to modernize our systems and create operational benefits that improve efficiency in the national airspace. At a Next Gen Advisory Council meeting last month, it, made, it was made clear that programs are over budget by millions of dollars and multiple years behind schedule. There are dozens of projects, but let me give you one example. Most of the people in this room recognize what these are. These are the paper strips that air traffic controllers walk back and forth across the air traffic control tower. The FAA has been working on electronic flight strips for over 20 years. Most countries already have the technology in place. As of today, the FAA is planning to start installation in one tower in 2024. But because of budget overruns, they're now saying that instead of 89 towers eventually, it's going to be 49. These myriad modernization programs have a myriad, um, material impact on operational efficiency of the NAS and flight delays and cancellations. There needs to be accountability and transparency. You know, next gen is a bad joke in the industry. We've all talked about it for years. We need to get together, government, all across the aviation sector, and later and figure out solutions now. We can't just keep letting things where they are because the problem's only gonna get worse. So, I've been pretty direct uh, about a few issues that impact our industry, but let's not miss the, the larger point. Because of our joint work during the pandemic between airlines, government, and labor, our industry is coming back, and we are going to come back all the way. It's incumbent upon us, it is imperative, that we all make our commitment to work together to fix the problems and make this industry even stronger than it has been in years past. Thank you. So we mentioned, uh, first of all, I want to welcome um, our panelists. Uh, you know who they are, Faye Malarkey Black, Randy Babbitt, and Patrick Byrne. Um, we talked about sustainability in that video. There's another component that's critical to having a sustainable industry, and that's having a solid pipeline of employees. And we're suffering a little bit now. We're hiring aggressively, as I said, but there is so much more to do, and we have some experts with us with points of views that we plan to share, um, you know, about the problems we're trying to solve and how we might go ahead and solve them. So let me start with Faye and Patrick, if I may. From the RAA perspective and a global network carrier perspective, can you lay out for us exactly what the nature and scope of the workforce challenges are that you're seeing and need to be solved? And then give us an idea, if you would, about the self-help measures that you're taking to try to fix those. Thanks, Nick. I'll start. Um, you talked a little bit, and some of the other panelists today have talked about, look, workforce issues are endemic, right? It's not unique to aviation. But in aviation, we're specialized, they're certificated, there's lengthy and timely and uh, costly training. And so it, it adds a layer of complexity. And I think the rest of the panel will talk a little bit about all sectors of aviation, all really important, but I'm going to talk about pilots primarily because the regional airline industry has been facing a well-known pilot shortage that you know, preceded the pandemic. The pandemic, we sometimes hear, you know, caused a pilot shortage. 
That's just not so. The pilot shortage was here and the pandemic accelerated it. So now we had some of the retirements that would have happened this year were happening a little bit earlier and growth rebounded. And so all of those things are factors, but the reality is there was already a pilot shortage present. And so our members were really on the leading edge of trying to solve it and get ahead of it. And so, you know, compensation strategies, you, you can't open a newspaper without seeing that. That makes headlines. But there are also investments in flow programs that I think we'll talk about a little bit today that give pilots career stability that they really want. Um, they're reaching back into the universities and even to the high schools and middle schools and giving you know, curriculum support, tuition reimbursement, helping to reach out to people who may not have been introduced to aviation before. So these and other self-help measures have been in place. But I have to tell you, you can only do so much. They're, the number one thing keeping people out of aviation is the high barriers of entry. It's costly. It's time consuming. They don't have enough access to structured training. And these are things that we can solve. And until we do, all of those investments are only going to take us so far because there's this fundamental issue under everything that we have not yet addressed, which is giving people a front door to the industry. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't say anything better than that. I'm going to echo your, your sentiments. Uh, if we look at uh, barriers to entry, address them, recognize them, address them, and there's a number of those barriers out there, uh, I think that's an important part. But also diversifying our workforce. Five to six percent of the pilot workforce is women. Fifty percent of our population is women. There's a solution right there uh, just waiting for us to solve. Um, there, and there's a lot of layers to this. We talk a lot about the pilot pipeline, and the pipeline uh, has important steps all along, flight training, and then the very next step from flight training is flight instructing, perhaps, and then a couple different stops along the way to the major airlines. It could be a 135 operation, it could be a regional operation, military, and then to the majors. And I think we have to address uh, the health of all of those stops along the way, because they're all critical if we're going to get to somebody uh, with the experience necessary and the training necessary to get to a mainline level. Now, Nikki talked about self-help. Uh, we hired more than 2,400 pilots as the plan for 2022. That's a step in the right direction. That's more than 200 pilots a month at Delta Airlines. Um, that's almost twice what we would consider a high mark in the past. And if you look a little further ahead, 10 years from now, uh, Delta's going to hire 8,000 more pilots between now uh, and, and 10 years from now, in part uh, due to mandatory retirement age, but also for growth and, and attrition and things like that. Um, and to your point, Faye, this didn't happen because of, of COVID. This, we saw this uh, years ahead. And so back in at Delta, back in 2016, 2017, we started building a program known as Propel. That is our uh, pilot career path program. Started building that in those eight years, certainly prior to COVID. Uh, and the idea behind a program like that isn't just uh, one slice uh, of what we talk about this pipeline. The program is a, it's a community program. It's a company program. It's a collegiate program. And it was designed specifically to go back to, you mentioned, high school and middle school um, uh, age uh, men and women. Uh, and a lot of that was uh, just making this, uh, this, this career path, all of aviation, known. So a lot of this was just an education piece. And if you have those conversations with middle schoolers and high schoolers, guess what? They're going to have that conversation at the dinner table and the parents get more informed. And so we start just generating some of this uh, interest in, in, in aviation. Um, and we partner at Delta with fam some familiar names in our industry, uh, Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, Women in Aviation International, uh, NIFA, the National Intercollegiate Flying Association, the National Flight Academy in Pensacola, for example. And then internally to Delta, we have community outreach programs. We have an amazing uh, uh, program we call the Wing Flight, Women Inspiring the Next Generation. Uh, professional uh, female pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, rampers, uh, ramp controllers, they fly uh, an airplane full of middle uh, and high school age uh, young women and girls down the Pensacola to the National Flight Academy. That's just exposure. And it goes back to the, if you can see it, you can be it. Um, the company program we have, this Propel company program, uh, passionate about that. Uh, we talk about barriers. Uh, I put myself through college, financial barriers. I graduated from Embry-Riddle, but I couldn't afford the flight training program. So I started uh, gently placing bags on the bottom of airplanes for Delta Airlines just up the road in Philadelphia. And uh, the whole idea was I worked in a lot of different areas within the company, building flight time, but I had to leave the company that I didn't want to leave in the mid-90s um, to do the, the paths that we talked about, uh, traditional path, relatively speaking, the regionals, and then fortunate to get hired back at Delta Airlines. So our company path, for anybody who has the same dream that I had 
we're going to make that, op uh, that opportunity available for folks that already work for Delta Airlines and get them to the flight deck. And then lastly, the collegiate program right now. We started off with uh, eight universities, well-known universities. Before we put all these things into place, we, we did a market research in a sense. And what we asked uh, young um, uh, people looking for career opportunities, what they were looking for, and one of them, you talked about it, Faye, earlier, is there was no real clear path. What's the return on my investment for my education and for my flight training? How do I get to the major airline? It wasn't very clear. So Propel was designed to actually clarify that path. Uh, they also wanted choices. What, what opportunities do I have within this aviation? So Propel was designed to give young aviators a chance to work for the regional or Delta Connection carriers, to work for a corporate, uh, again, partnering with Wheels Up at Delta Airlines, or serve our country through the uh, Guard and Reserves. So all that was built into the program because we listened to the folks that, um, that told us that they wanted to get into this. Um, you fast forward, like I said, uh, how do we solve that going forward? We have to expand that further. So at Propel, we're looking at opportunities like partnering with military uh, to bridge enlisted personnel coming out. How do we get them to the flight deck at Delta Airlines? And so Propel can expand to do that, I think. Uh, and years ago, Delta was in the flight school business. And we're talking now to vendors to, uh, to look at that possibility to do that again. So there's a lot of different pieces. Uh, the way Propel was designed uh, was so that if you're, uh, if you're in the, the university program, for example, you stay in the university program so that you pay it forward. You don't leave when uh, an airline calls you up uh, because you have to get your students through. And so it helps the university. It helps the regionals as well. Uh, we went from eight universities to 15 universities at Propel right now. It's a really great opportunity. Uh, welcome our first HBCUs. Hampton University is with us. Um, Elizabeth City State uh, University is with us now, and uh, we have a partnership uh, in San Juan, Puerto Rico with Inter-American University. So we have to be intentional about diversity, and we have to partner with people that are good at that, and we have to get better at that. Uh, is this directed only at pilots, or does this include mechanics, you know, flight attendants, the whole bit? Well, I am selfishly looking for <laughs> pilots as the chief pilot of the airline, but I'm glad you asked, Nick, because there's a very similar program. I can, I can speak to what we do at Delta. My friends and colleagues at uh, Technical Operations, our tech ops group, um, have Tech U. And again, to do the same things in, in, in similar ways, um, we've hired 1,500 aviation maintenance technicians in 2022. Uh, and if you look at some resources, 600,000 opportunities, 600,000 AMT jobs potentially in the next 20 years. Uh, we partner with 50, actually more than 50, of the best uh, uh, airframe and paraplant uh, schools in the country. And the support that we provide them is resources, uh, curriculum, access to our technical facilities around the world, around the country, certainly. Um, and these are really good paying jobs. We, we were very familiar, I think, with, uh, with the earning potential of pilots, but entry level uh, AMTs at Delta Airlines, you're making uh, $65,000, $70,000 a year, six figures. and six, seven years, um, there's a lot of potential there. Again, intentionally trying to be diverse with that. Okay. You raise a great point, and one of the things that we're finding is that you know, apprenticeships are so important yeah. for the aircraft maintainers. And hearing what you're talking about, all of the um, effort that you're putting in with partnerships with universities, I mean, that's another way that our members were you know, out on the front edge of that. We even have a member that started up a foundational flight, tra or fi flight training academy. Mm -hmm. Um, and while they were doing that, they said, hey, well, we need aircraft maintainers. And so they stood up an apprentice program. And one of the things that really resonates there is that they can earn while they learn. So when you're a young person, maybe you've been out in the, you know, the world for a little bit, you've taken on some debt, maybe you're a single parent, you can't just take time off of work to, you know, to, to go and gently place yeah. those bags. You've, you've got to be able to earn. Uh, and I think that is, we're really onto something there with apprenticeships, whether it be for uh, aircraft uh, maintainers or something to learn from that and, and maybe start to embrace ab initio and other support for pilots in the United States. You mentioned regulatory certification. Um, there, there, this is complex work. It's, it's hard work and nobody's trying to make this easy. What we're trying to do is improve access to these, these really rewarding jobs. Financially, yes, but very rewarding jobs. Randy, anything you want to add to what they've said before I ask you a specific question? No, I, I think they've laid it out very well. I think uh, one of the pieces that we probably all should think about is we all know what a STEM program is. Uh, I advocate several places and boards that I'm on that we should create a STEAM, put an A, mm -hmm. aviation, uh, into these programs so that people are introduced to it earlier in life and, and have more exposure. Uh, I think we need to be a little creative. We, we had a, a situation as you went through the pandemic uh, you know, I, I'm not somebody who likes to focus on, let's repeat all the 
different reasons to blame why we're short. Uh, I'm a little more focused on what are we going to do to get out of the problem? What are the solutions we can do? Uh, we are here, and it's awfully hard to have, uh, for example, an apprentice program if the mainline carrier is only flying 20% of its operation. Then, by definition, you can only have 20% of your new employees being mentored. Uh, we're past that, and so what we do going forward, and I think we could be creative. Uh, I'll, I'll throw something out that uh, I think you know a lot of the carriers are either have or are talking about having a program in-house. We're going to train our mechanics. We're going to train people in-house. That's a long process. A mechanic, it's a two-year process. Yeah. You don't just come in and take a written and say, okay, I'm ready. No, it's a long process. And so uh, when you think of how important aviation is to the big cities, the small communities, I mean, they literally move, I don't have the exact number, but trillions of dollars of this nation's goods and services depend on the airline industry. Mm -hmm. So what about the thought that we might give uh, airlines tax credits for training employees? Just give them tax credits. Take, you know, just, you just won't pay tax on that money and, in, and you're gonna provide a lot of good jobs for a lot of people that are very needed in the industry. Who will then pay taxes? Who will then pay taxes, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, Randy, you've seen the industry from a range of perspectives um, over the years, including FAA administrator and head of the Airline Pilots Association. Um, as you know, Alpha has been pretty outspoken in saying there is not a pilot shortage. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us a perspective on how and whether you think, uh, why they think that, and whether there's a perspective here that you can offer for us to find common ground with them. Sure. Well, I think the key phrase there, Nick, is common ground. Uh, I think we have a problem and we need a solution for the problem. And complaining about it or pointing fingers, that's not going to solve it. And, uh, and I, don't, I also believe greatly in data. Uh, and data is not supporting some of the issues that are being broadcast. But go back to common ground, and I'm, I'm always encouraged to see Carol here. Uh, when I was a brand spanking new president of Alpha, Carol called me up, and she was head of, of your, your company today, uh, and she said, we should have lunch. And I'm thinking, why should we have lunch? You represent <laughs> the management of all those companies, and I represent the pilots. And a great statement, Carol, I quote you often. Uh, Carol said, you know, we're going to have differences. But about 90% of what we undertake, we have in common. It's aviation. Uh, and we need to find ways to say aviation needs to solve a problem. And at the core of, and yes, uh, between being the president of ALPA and then the head of the FAA, those are two groups that don't often laugh at the same jokes. And uh, <laughs> so you know, we, I had my work cut out for me. And I can tell you programs like telling the pilots we're going to have ASAP. So you want me to tell you know, the FAA that I made a mistake. Uh, are you kidding? And uh, no, I'm not kidding. That's, that's not what they said. It was a little more colorful. It was a little yeah. more colorful. And, and conversely, on the FAA side, they said, that's just a get out of jail free card for the pilots. But what has, what has ASAP turned into? What are the greatest safety things that we do in aviation? And the data proves it. Asias, another. That wasn't an easy sell. You, you tell the carrier, I want you to turn over all your data. All of it? Yes, all of it and uh, we're going to use it and the things that have come from Messias and those programs are incredible and safety is the one word that's common to all of those yeah, improvements another question for you and i'm sure Faye will want to jump in on this um, it appears that wages are going up for network pilots and for regional pilots what impact do you think that's going to have impact yes to the people getting the raise or no <laughs> <laughs> They're going to pay more taxes. Uh, no, it, it clearly is raising cost, and uh, and I think you're seeing some uh, clear indications that carriers uh, are willing to offer more and bonuses and so forth to get people in. But I mean, th this is a long process, and I think you know there's a lot of other things to consider to get this pipeline running more smoothly again with, with different ideas and, and suggestions and, and you know structured training and things like that will help the problem. I, I think in the short term. Uh, you're going to see some, some, you know, cost inflation on the carrier side. But the other side of it, I mean, you've had a number of years where we were pretty stagnant uh, across the board. So hopefully it'll balance out. You know, and here's, here's the thing, Nick. That, too, is not new. You know, we have you know, been looking at, the, at, at this pilot shortage looming for many years, and those pay increases were happening. And ironically enough, the workforce has actually shrunk um, even as that pay has increased. Um, make no mistake, you know, pilots deserve to be well compensated. So do 
every aviation employee's it's an incredibly important job. And right now we don't have enough. You know, they're, the BLS just updated their outlook. They say 18,100 pilots are going to be needed every year for the next decade. When we look back at what the FAA has traditionally certificated, that number is you know, between 6,000, 7,000, sometimes a little bit higher on a high year like now when people are playing catch up. But the fact remains there are not enough pilots for all the communities, and communities are losing air service. 332 communities have lost air service now, even though demand is soaring compared to the pandemic. And that's not a small amount. The average loss there is over one in five flights. Um, so people are really losing their meaningful access to the system. And yes, pay has increased, but these communities are still losing their air service. And if you look at it from a community's perspective, it's a game of musical chairs, or you can view it like a pie. And no matter how much we're paying per the slice of pie, there are only so many slices of pie. Uh, and communities have lost air service, and we can and should fix this. I'll add just one piece, Please. if I may. Uh, we talked earlier about return on investment. And so young people making choices in careers have to look at that. And so the wage, to your point, it, it, it doesn't matter what part of the aviation sector we're looking at, whether it's a dispatcher, flight attendant, aviation maintenance technician, or pilot. Uh, we're competing in a tight labor market. Now, you said it earlier as well. I mean, the industry can expands and contracts, and that's part of the industry. And, and, and we're challenged right now with resources, and I think we can solve that for a number of ways. Pay is not the only solution, and, and quite honestly, uh, probably won't solve some of the problems. This is more structural, more resource. You know, just one more point on that. You raised the training investment. Pilots get a better ROI on their training dollar than doctors and lawyers and all sorts of other prestigious uh, wage groups. And in fact, pilots are the second highest, second only to medicine. So there's never been a better time. And one of the things we really need to do is look at the student loan. Very topical now. Um, but look at student loans. You think that somebody can just go out and get a student loan to become a commercial airline pilot. Well, they can't. They can use student loans for that, but the costs are much higher. And so one thing we can do right now is to right size that lending pool so people from all walks of life can get into this career because that's not going to just broaden the pilot pool, but it's going to take us a long way toward getting that needed diversity in our flight deck. Absolutely. Just a side note to add to that, uh, I have six grandchildren, so I'm quite familiar with 529 programs. <laughs> you can't use 529 programs to pay for flight training. It's part of an education. And, and, that, and I realize it's not a federal, those are done by states, but states need to rethink that to allow people to use the 529 money. It's intended for education, and that would be part of your education. So the point's the same, though. It should be used, yes. and you should be able to. Yeah. Yeah. Skills development is education, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so we're all excited about the fact that we have an FAA reauthorization bill coming up next year. And in terms of the issues that you've identified, what would be the top two or three priorities for that bill that you think ought to be part of it? All right, I'll start. Um, I think meaningful access for regional airlines, but more importantly for the passengers that rely on regional airlines. Um, I think Congress is going to, you know, look, they've done a great job with outreach programs, pilot programs. You know, these are, they're modestly funded, but they're a good start, and they do help people to see into the industry. But again, you've got to be able to connect people with the industry. Now, I think that Congress will stay in its comfort zone, um, those types of pilot programs, that those types of outreach programs. But we really need to come together as an industry and solve some of the underlying access issues making education more affordable, making sure people can finance it, and looking at structured training and how that can help facilitate and better support and offer more airline support for candidates coming through the system. And on that, while that seems like it could be controversial, and you know, I think maybe we've done ourselves a disservice by talking about pilot training as something that will solve a pilot shortage crisis. Now, make no mistake, this will give more people access but what we ought to be talking about when we talk about pilot training is how we can make things safer and better and more supportive for the candidates coming through so that the system that you all fly and Americans fly and I and my family fly is as safe as possible, but we can also use it and we're not moving to the roads and the highways where the fatality rate is soaring. Well, I'll... Uh... I'll go back to what we talked about just a little bit earlier, and that's funding for uh, workforce and skills development, I think, is, is really important. 
uh, for us to focus on. Again, it's, it's not just throwing bodies at it, not just throwing cash at it. It's the right bodies with the right education, the right certification. The other thing I would like to see, and I sit on the Next Gen Advisory uh, Committee, I would like to see uh, infrastructure investments as well. We talk a lot about infrastructure uh, currently. Uh, but flow tools. Uh, it doesn't matter if we have every pilot, every mechanic, every uh, other um, uh, skill in the aviation industry if we're all waiting in line to taxi because we can't get airplanes into the system. So I would like to see advancements in the infrastructure and the control mechanisms uh, to manage the increasing flow of traffic uh, in our country and then and how we do that as well with our um, other agencies um, uh, around the world. Randy? Yeah, I, I would add, uh, I think uh, we could do a lot of things. One different area that I'll talk about is incentivizing the FAA uh, to uh, provide incentives to carriers for performance, uh, compliance. Uh, you have a good record, uh, you should be rewarded for that. Uh, if you stay in compliance, you're not violating the rules, that has value. Uh, and, you, you know, I think that's a, something you can do. It, it, it really provides a big incentive for the carriers to do things correctly. Uh, and, you know, if, if you don't have to spend your time in court paying fines, uh, you're far better off. Uh, I also believe in the infrastructure. I think uh, we've got to make some changes. We talk about, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, will this, even with things that are currently on the drawing board going into the air traffic control system, does anybody think that that's going to handle what we're looking at 15 years from now? I don't. Uh, we're going to need some uh, very serious changes to how and what equipment we use and, and the technology uh, along with the personnel that are going to run it and uh, you know we can't just talk about the pilots yeah. uh, have, have no airspace to fly in you're not going anywhere so uh, it's all all comes into a bundle I know I'm supposed to be moderating and not talking but in my remarks I tried to address that it's, you know uh, I was talking earlier at one early congressional hearing I testified and I brought in all the testimony from ATA A4A from previous years talking about next gen and talk about an education. We talk about it over and over again and we keep not making progress. Mm -hmm. And we have spent a lot of money, you know, and there are staff, but we need to take a look at that because it is infrastructure, it's critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. and it also, interestingly, has a huge impact on sustainability, mm -hmm. right? And so it's the perfect storm. We need the focus and we need the leadership to let shake things up and okay. have some practical measurements about what progress we're making. Years and years for all these programs on the book doesn't make a lot of sense. Patrick? You know, infrastructure is, a, is, a, is an in, important piece of this and we've done a lot of great work. But the infrastructure in, in the FAA infrastructure also has to be uh, aligned with the avionics and components on the airplane and also in the control systems um, uh, at the individual carriers so that we can feed information to the command center so that this all works together seamlessly. Um, okay, we're talking about reauthorization. Um, absent reauthorization in the immediate term or in the long term, as we all know, the checkered history there. Um, anything the administration can be doing non-legislatively to make things better right now? I'll, I'll start off. Uh, one of the areas that concerns me, and uh, there's been a lot of dialogue uh, you know, the, the FOQ, the 1500 hour rule was put in, I understand, I was the administrator when it was put in, I understand why it was put in. Uh, but in that legislation, they made great provisions in, in more than one place, uh, and, and by the way, a lot of great things came out of that legislation, the Pilot Records Act, a number yeah. of things, all improving safety. But uh, one of the things they put in that I don't think we're utilizing well enough is very clear, and you can read Chairman Costello's comments on the issue, that this 1,500 hours is a benchmark, but we should give credit for supplemental training. And we've done it right off the bat. The military goes down to 750. It's impressive training. Uh, you go through uh, an Abbey certified school and get a degree. You, you only need 1,000, 1,200 with an associate's degree. So why couldn't an airline, why couldn't Delta Airlines have a top-notch training facility and hire a pilot with, with 600 hours and give them 150 hours in their facility uh, as intense as the military would train them because, by the way, that training is going to be multi-crew environment, we're going to do uh, cockpit resource management, we're going to do all the structured things that they're actually going to do for a living. Uh, just amassing time in your logbook uh, by yourself, uh, I, I don't think achieves that. So I think uh, the FAA could do, and, and by the way, two ARCs have made the same uh, conclusion that the legislation led them to, which is, yes, we should 
provide more access or credibility and credits for the supplemental type training. So I think they could move in that direction. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. You know, I think that that legislative remedy has already, you know, Congress set the key in 2010. And the standard that they set, by the way, is not just that you have to go out and make something just as safe, but the standard is to make things safer. And in that way, they've actually incentivized all of us to come together and show through data uh, and science that this is how we can do it. We can actually, you know, we're not going to leave to chance that a pilot will encounter some of these experiences. We're going to take and put them in the simulator and expose them again and again to an engine out or this or wind shear and things happening in a complex environment that they're just not going to get as valuable as accumulating time is when they're flying in fair weather in non-complex aircraft in uncontrolled airspace. These are not things that they will see, and we can make sure that they're ready by leaning into structured training. And again, that doesn't require a change. It just requires all of us coming together and looking at the science and the data and letting that lead us to what is safest. The only thing I'll add to that, Nick, is, is oversight doesn't end at 1,500 hours. At, at 1,501 hours, arguably, there's more oversight, depending on what you're doing and where you're flying. So, the, so the, the, every flight hour is not the same as every other flight hour. And whatever the solution is, certainly, it's got to improve safety, and it's got to make sense, and, and, and Delta certainly will be compliant with that. Well, we've got about two minutes and 20 seconds left. So a question for all of you in brief, and take all the issues that we've been, on, been unpacking here. What's your view of the industry five or 10 years from now if we do well on those issues or if we don't do well on those issues? All right, I'll take the lightning lane, okay? I think, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got two tracks ahead of us, really, and, and we can take path A or we can take path B. And unfortunately, we've already started down the track on path A. Communities have lost service. We have not invested enough. We are not doing enough to give people access to this career. The best time to solve the pilot shortage would have been seven to 10 years ago. The second best time to solve the pilot shortage is now. Unfortunately, I don't know that there's, there's much we can do right now, um, short of some of these short-term provisions that we've seen that would slow attrition while we can welcome more people into the career and give them an excellent path forward. But if we put these solutions in place now, communities can stop some of the air service loss, and I think over time they could start to rebuild that. But we have to act now, and we have to act with courage, and we have to treat this as a network pilot shortage, not just a regional pilot shortage, because we all share the passengers, and we all want to travel to every community, large and small. So I think we have two choices, and I know which one I want to make. I'll echo uh, a little bit of what I said earlier. I think we're going to have to make some serious infrastructure improvements. If we don't, we're talking about a, an industry that will not be robust. Uh, if it's not robust, what does in an airline world that it's not robust do? They don't buy airplanes. They don't build new airports. They don't service, you know, how are we going to move our goods and services on a limited supply of airplanes and, and services? Uh, and that requires uh, improvements to the air traffic control system. It, it probably, across the board, we're going to have to continue to invest in this industry, uh, both in its personnel and its infrastructure, uh, we're looking at a, what I think is a dark cloud. Patrick, last word. Yeah, for me, uh, this is an economic powerhouse. Uh, it, it generates a lot of revenue. Travel and tourism is the size. It's the 800-pound grill in a lot of rooms. Uh, and if we don't do this well and we don't do it right, we don't have that. Uh, and also a vibrant uh, source of jobs and diverse workforce makes this country better. Uh, and if we don't do that well, we won't have that. Great. Please join me in thanking the panelists for a very informative session. Thank you. Thank you. Randy, thanks, man.